Okay, I think it's time to start. Uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, my name is Eduardo Suarez. Um, some of you know I'm the head of communications at the Reuters Institute um, and I will be uh, chairing the event. Um, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, she will be Joy Jenkins. Uh, she's a research associate at the Reuters Institute. She's also assistant professor at the School of Journalism and Electronic Media at the University of Tennessee. Um, you know, some of you know uh, by now, but here are more or less the rules of, of the seminar. I will, you know, uh, make this uh, brief presentation and after that, um, uh, Joy will uh, present. Um, uh, we're gonna do it in a slightly different way today because uh, Joy can't uh, actually share her screen, so I will you know, help with that and share my screen so you can see uh, the presentation. Uh, and at the end, uh, she will take questions uh, from all of you. So I, I really encourage you um, uh, to send as many questions as you can uh, through the chat uh, function that you can see at the bottom of your, of your screen. Uh, the whole webinar uh, should take an hour or so. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Joy and I'm gonna try to share my screen. Joy, just let me know if there is something wrong or something that I should do differently. The floor is yeah, yours. Thank you. So, okay, I think um, it's gonna take a couple of minutes. Here it is, can you see it? I can see it. Great. Thank you so Perfect. much. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, <laughs> depending on where you are. Um, thank you so much to the to the Writers Institute for having me here today. I'm really excited to share the primary findings from an ongoing research project focused on the digital transition of local news around Europe. Uh, to give a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today, first I'll provide some context about the landscape of local media and some distinctive challenges that are facing this sector in the digital environment. I'll then discuss the methods used for this research as well as describe the local and regional newspapers that made up the sample. I will also offer an overview of the key themes that have emerged from this research, particularly as they relate to monetization models, new approaches to digital content production, editorial strategies, and relationships with platforms, particularly Facebook. I'll, offer, I'll also conclude by offering a brief case study in the UK of a local newspaper that has reemerged after closure and is finding success with its print edition. So, um, so Eduardo, if you'd go to the next slide, please. Good to get. All right, so a little bit of background here. Uh, around the world, legacy media are continuing to grapple with the shifts resulting from the move to a digital, mobile, and platform dominated media environment. Uh, more and more news organizations are turning to paid content models in their efforts to enhance digital earnings in the face of continually declining advertising and subscription revenues. Uh, however, according to the 2019 Digital News Report, most countries have seen only a small increase in the numbers of people paying for any online news. And in countries with higher levels of payment, most people have only one online subscription. And there's also a risk of subscription fatigue if they're asked to subscribe to too many different types of outlets. They are also grappling with a social media environment in which users are increasingly turning to private messaging apps for sharing and discussing news. Um, trust in the news overall has also declined, according to the last digital news report at 42%, a decline of two percentage points from the previous year. And there's some concerns about the ability of news organizations not only to break news, but also to adequately explain it. Um, so local media amidst all these challenges often face even more acute challenges and the local sector has long felt the implications of uh, challenges like ownership consolidation, losses in advertising and subscription revenues resulting from the rise of digital consumption, which has led to reduced publication frequency for some outlets, shrinking newsrooms and in some cases some outright closures. 
And even uh, with all these challenges going on, according to the 2019 Pew Research Survey in the US, audiences are often not aware of the revenue challenges that their local outlets face, and few said they pay for local news. In the US, this has led to conversations about nonprofit and publicly funded models for local news, and those conversations are very much gaining steam. Naturally, the global COVID-19 crisis has caused even more strains on local media. And although many local outlets have seen unprecedented traffic levels as audiences seek information about the pandemic and how it's affecting their communities, some predict that 2020 could be the worst year yet for local media, which are facing losses in advertising and event revenues, declining newsstand sales and halted deliveries, layoffs and furloughs, and some consolidation and closure. The pandemic has also led many, including those in the media sector, politicians, uh, representatives from platform companies, to herald the value of local news and distributing credible local information audiences would not receive otherwise, and in some cases calling for government response. But finally, although their efforts tend to receive less attention than those of their national and international counterparts, local and regional news organizations have worked to adapt to these challenges and trends. They've created new digital products and processes and initiatives and developed auxiliary revenue strategies to continue to find ways to serve their readers and communities. If you go to the next slide, please. So the research I'll be talking about today follows up on a report published in April 2018 with Rasmus Claes Nielsen. And the first digital transition of local news report was based on 48 interviews with editors, reporters, and commercial directors at newspapers and editorial and commercial, and ex commercial executives at parent companies in four countries, in the UK, France, Germany, and Finland. And the interviews for this report were focused broadly on the digital transition of local and regional newspapers and how they defined and navigated the challenges and opportunities they face, including creating digital first newsrooms, adapting to audience needs, and diversifying their business models. And as a result of this research, we suggested that parent companies were pursuing three different overall strategies for producing and monetizing local news in the digital age. And these include, which I'll discuss briefly, and I definitely recommend you check out the report from additional context. Um, but the first is national scale. And this is a model that was particularly evident in the UK that emphasizes economies of scale pursued through the acquisition of a portfolio of different titles that can draw the largest possible audience and that was primarily monetized through advertising. Uh, we also identified the regional breadth approach, and this was similar, so it's an approach emphasizing economies of scale, but that is focused on developing a more focused portfolio for a particular region, and the local publishers within this model um, used paid content models and pursued auxiliary forms of revenue, such as events, services, e-commerce, and some others. And finally, the local depth approach. And this was an approach pursued by individual local titles as well as those titles owned by smaller parent companies. And these are organizations that were editorially and financially powered by their communities and regions. And they found ways to sustain their work through premium content, subscription models, and auxiliary revenue sources. Uh, next slide. So for this research, I revisited the case organizations highlighted in that 2018 report. And specifically, I wanted to examine how local and regional newspapers around Europe are navigating the pivot to paid, as the digital news report described it, embraced by many legacy news organizations. I specifically focused on the perspectives of managers and editors at the newspapers, as well as some editorial and commercial representatives from their parent companies. And this research is based based on 20 interviews conducted between December 2019 and March 2020 um, with managers and editors at those local and regional newspapers. And two of the interviews at Nice Matan were conducted in July 2019. And of course, these interviews were conducted before the rise of the pandemic, so they should definitely be understood uh, in that context. Uh, next slide. 
So here are the uh, local and regional news organizations that I visited and talked with as part of this research. So for the 2018 report, we chose two similar sized local or regional newspapers in each of the countries. Um, for this most recent research, we also added the Yorkshire Post. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about these outlets to give some context about some of their similarities and differences. Uh, so first in Finland, um, we have Etula Suman Sanomat, which is a metropolitan daily newspaper founded in 1900 and published in Lati in southern Finland. And the newspaper was family owned until 2016 when it was purchased by Keskasumalanian. We also have Kalava, which is a daily regional newspaper that has been published in Oulu in northern Finland since 1899. And the Kaliba Media Group publishes Kalava, as well as Forum 24, which is a free newspaper for the Oulu City Center. And Kalava also recently acquired La Fincanza, a regional newspaper, and two additional free city newspapers. In France, I spoke book with Nice Matan, which is a regional newspaper group based in Nice in southeastern France. The group was formerly owned by Group Persant Media uh, and facing bankruptcy in 2014. The employees there formed a cooperative and crowdsourced 400,000 euro as well as secured other financial support to acquire their media group. I also talked with West France, which is a regional newspaper group based in Rennes in Western France. It was founded in 1944, and the West France group now includes 58 editorial offices and 12 departments. It publishes 53 daily local editions as well as two digital editions, and I'll talk about those later in the presentation. In Germany, Mindpost is a daily regional newspaper based in Würzburg in Bavaria. It's owned by Median Group Pressdruck, which is a family-owned publisher in Augsburg. And the main post group includes the flagship newspaper and 16 local editions, as well as four other newspaper titles. Uh, Westphalen Post is a daily regional newspaper based in Hagen, Germany. It's the largest newspaper in Southwest Westphalia, and it's one of 12 regional newspapers owned by Funke Median Group. And the newspaper includes 13 local editions. And finally, in the UK, I talked with Kent Messenger, which is a weekly newspaper serving the Kent area. And the newspaper is the flagship title for the KM Media Group, which publishes nine paid for and four free newspapers. And that media group was acquired by ILIF Media in April 2017. And lastly, the Yorkshire Post is a daily newspaper published in Leeds in Northern England, uh, founded in 1754. It's one of the oldest newspapers in the country and was previously owned by Johnston Press and is now operated by JPI Media. Uh, next slide. So in our 2018 report, the managers, editors, and journalists identified some common challenges and opportunities in their work. Uh, staff members at nearly all of the newspapers in the sample noted that they had seen declining circulation numbers and advertising revenues, and they were working to monetize their online content and traffic, develop new digital products, particularly those focused on video, and attract younger readers. Um, they also highlighted the need to better understand and engage with their audiences, reduce their reliance on distribution through platforms, particularly Facebook, and convince readers and colleagues of the value of investing in digital content. And two years later, um, interviewees highlighted very similar concerns and goals, as well as some new initiatives designed to attract audiences and create loyal and lasting relationships. And I'll go through some of these challenges and opportunities briefly. So first in the challenges column, uh, interviewees discuss the importance of drawing digital subscribers to their news products. And this includes not only the on their websites, but also digital publications, e-papers, apps, videos, and podcasts. And I'll talk a little bit more about podcasts later in the presentation. Interviewees discussed also the need to refine their websites to make accessing and subscribing to paid content a more efficient and intuitive process for their readers. And in some cases, parent companies such as Keska Sumalanian in Finland are working to develop shared platforms so that multiple outlets can use those to help more easily engage with readers. In some cases, news organizations, particularly those in the UK, had only recently deployed their paid content models or were considering making that transition. So that required them to very much reinforce to readers and to launch communication campaigns around why paying for local news is necessary and explain the value of well-resourced local journalism. 
And finally, in the challenges area, as news organizations continue to grapple with reader concerns about the prevalence of misinformation and disinformation in the online space, interviewees talked about the challenge of building reader trust, as well as maintaining credibility as a result of their uh, reporting and their editorial projects. In terms of opportunities, uh, I saw a lot of conversation about interviewees valuing preserving their print products and the value of their print products, which often and in most cases account for the majority of their revenues, while harnessing the potential of digital products and markets. And this is a phenomenon we could think of as ambidextrous organizations, where they leverage the value of those print products while pursue some innovative new digital opportunities. They also discussed ways they're adjusting their newsrooms to more efficiently create digital content, including centralized online desks and teams, and efforts to create digital first cultures in their newsrooms in which everyone is involved with monitoring analytics and producing multimedia content. Some interviewees, and this isn't a time where engagement is a really popular um, trend for news organizations, they said that they are very much working to make the reporting process more transparent and emphasizing opportunities for readers to get involved, such as sharing ideas for topics that journalists can report on or participating in crowdsource reporting initiatives. And lastly, all interviewees discuss the importance of embracing efforts to create distinctive and exclusive local content that serves communities and that constitutes what they deem as very high quality local journalism. Uh, so next slide, please. So the most significant aspect of digital transformation at the case newspapers was the emphasis on paid content models. And as we know, legacy publishers around the world are turning to subscriptions and memberships and other approaches to enhance their digital revenues with some national and international brands drawing large numbers of subscribers. However, to successfully make this transition can be difficult for local news organizations who might have fewer resources to invest in the same types of digital tools. Um, but what I found is that news organizations across the sample have incorporated various forms of paid content, which are evident here in this table, including metered paywalls and freemium and premium models, which are very similar, um, but have some differences as well. Um, and they were also seeing some early signs of success. Um, some of the news organizations have recently implemented their paid models, for example, in the UK, as I mentioned, um, which in the 2018 report, we're still focusing primarily on online ads and traffic-based strategies. Others have had different forms of paywalls in place for years and are still working to experiment with the percentages of paid articles that they offer, subscriber and membership packages, and the types of content that are most likely to draw that paid readership. Um, so I'll briefly talk about some of the different models that were evident here. So MindPost in Germany um, had used a metered paywall model offering five months of free access, but they just recently transitioned to a freemium model. Um, they had seen some meet, some success with their metered strategy um, and were drawing high numbers of impressions, um, but they feel like the freemium model is going to allow them to more adequately highlight high quality content as well as identify loyal readers, which is something I'll talk more about. Um, Westfalen Post, um, oh, if you could go back, please, uh, uses a freemium model in which 70% of content is paid, uh, mostly original local content. Um, the editor said that the proportion of paid content has increased from 30% in 2018 now to 70%, which is a pretty significant shift. And they now have about 6,000 digital only subscribers. They also had an initiative in the fall that allowed users to access four weeks of online content for free, which resulted in about 800 new subscribers, which was very significant. West France uses a more hybrid freemium premium model, which offers uh, multiple digital offerings to draw subscribers and maintain scale. So for example, they have a complete digital subscription package that offers access to the morning digital edition, um, an evening edition, high value online content, digital archives, as well as a new digital newspaper called Minuit Sport. Nice Matan's digital strategy focuses on premium content as well, um, particularly long form solutions journalism that emphasizes reader engagement um, and subscribers have access to that solutions journalism content as well as a newsletter and opportunities to vote on upcoming investigations and to participate in those. 
Um, Etul and Sumasanamat uses a premium model where stories covered by other newspapers or that more uh, easily accessible in other places are offered for free and their more exclusive articles are paid. Um, they've seen their number of paid subscribers grow steadily about 37% over the last year. Um, Caliba's premium model, which is discussed in depth in the 2018 report, has grown to emphasize feature style, local stories on health, history, and other local human interest topics. Readers can also take advantage of a two-week free trial, um, and they remain engaged, um, the editors there, in ABC testing to determine what content is going to draw paying readers. Um, and this has worked well. They've seen some 30% growth in digital subscriptions over the last year. And lastly, in the UK, Kent Messenger is testing a micropayment strategy alongside 15 other iLIF media titles in which readers can pay 20p for a digital wallet of selected articles and up to 60p to access everything. Um, and the Yorkshire Post continues to focus on a programmatic revenue model. Uh, next slide. So in the quest to effectively monetize content um, and identify and better understand reader preferences, this was a key focus for interviewees. And in particular, many of them talked about the importance of differentiating between flyby readers and those who come in and out, um, perhaps from platforms or other sources, and those loyal readers who will pay for news. And many interviewees said that readers want both that standard local news fair, public court records, planning applications, consumer news, news, positive views that's useful for daily life, um, but they also want to engage in in-depth long reads and investigative journalism. And so this quote here shows how um, some of the interviewees talk about finding different ways to engage and, and hook those readers in. And Edward Rice Corona at West France said that people come to the site to read more minor news items, things like sports and health and everyday life topics, but the article, articles that convince them to stay are those with added value which is something that came up consistently in the interviews, such as international investigations. And so this quote here really shows that, that they're looking at dashboards, listing the topics that they have chances to transform people into subscribers and work on retention and reading engagement and duration. But ultimately they want content to be as attractive as possible to engage with them and get them to cross that subscription wall, as he put it. Uh, next slide. Interviewees also um, in the 2018 report discussed multiple strategies for more efficiently publishing digital content and attracting online advertisers. And these approach included strategies like centralized newsrooms, training journalists how to use analytics, and research and development departments for new editorial and advertising products. And these efforts have very much continued for the case newspapers in the sample, which have adjusted their practices to meet the changing habits and preferences of their target readers. And although they differed in the level of integration of their online desks, for example, they all emphasize the importance of journalists across the newsroom using social media, monitoring analytics, engaging in multimedia storytelling, and developing product ideas. And interviewees also discuss the importance of encouraging their staff members to think, rethink what makes an article valuable, particularly in the digital environment. Um, particularly in Germany, and I have a quote and an image here from the two German newsrooms, uh, they have been engaged in multi-year initiatives to develop more efficient and sustainable approaches. So at MindPost, for example, they continue to take a channel management approach to editorial, which is overseen by a centralized editorial team that they call the I. And this focuses on creating stories around broad themes, such as retirement, lifestyle, local events. And the strategy, it builds on a traditional beat system by offering more fluid themes that can spur both breaking news and more long-term types of coverage. Um, they've also implemented ways of categorizing their content to figure out what's going to work most effectively in a paid space. Uh, so for example, they'll label it as A, B, or C, where A topics draw very high readership and are produced you know, only a few times a week. Uh, B topics draw medium readership and tend to consist of top stories in their local editions, and C articles are free. They've also worked on quantifying articles. Um, so for example, they might be 
assigned a value of up to 40 points over a seven day period. And those points are assigned based on qualities such as how many people clicked, duration of reader attention, depth of reading, and whether they engage via hyperlink. And the quote here we can see from Andreas Kemper is that by adding all those different elements in the quantification process, they find that it's not just the same types of stories rising to the top. You can also find good journalism that's very exclusive and that's research driven. Uh, at West Fallen Post, they've also worked to better unite their print and digital workflows to reach their target groups. Uh, they focused on editorial dashboards and heat maps to see how content is performing. And they've spent the last two years transitioning print-oriented routines into digital-oriented workflows that address the question, according to editor Yos Lovin, how does journalism fit into the daily life of our readers? And that's led them to pursue themed issue. I have an image here from a sustainability focused editorial project that they did last year. And that's allowed them to combine digital advisors and Hagen with uh, journalists and local newsrooms to be able to create different types of products and projects. And it also allowed the editorial and the sales team to work more closely together to de develop editorial campaigns or develop campaigns around these themes. And finally, at West France, um, I have a picture here of their sports digital publication on the left. They separate their newsroom into a team focused on the premium content and one focused on traditional content. And Edward Rice Corona said he's also worked with the entire editorial team to reinforce the importance of investing time and resources into high quality digital journalism. Uh, next slide. And this move to paid content has also resulted in a heightened focus on producing quality journalism. And editors said that they focused on the move from homogenous content, as James Mitchinson at the Yorkshire Post described, to high quality content. Uh, some specifically talked about a focus on positive news, including stories that uplift communities. There was discussion of editorial campaigns in the UK context, as well as solutions journalism in the French context. And several interviewees said the goal now is to publish less and publish better, uh, which was a key theme among these outlets. And here's a couple of examples of that. So for example, at Atula Suman Sonomat in Finland, editor Hannah Myra said that although her team follows analytics very closely and they look at the traffic that their articles draw, they are not driven by metrics. And she said that although readers may be drawn to, for example, crime and accident stories, that's not necessarily what they want or always need. Um, so they focus on stories that help make the readers smarter and wiser and navigate their communities more effectively, which also helps them to maintain their credibility in a space where, you know, there may be questions about trust. Um, several newsrooms also embrace data-driven reporting. Um, so for example, the Solutions Journalism team at Nice Matan, I have a picture of the Solutions homepage here. Um, they've focused on slow journalism, addressing complex topics in engaging ways through text as well as interactive elements. And their goal is to identify local problems and then investigate and look at those who are working to solve them. And Aurora Maval, who's on the Solutions Journalism team, she's part of a data collective of local journalists in France, which has given training and tools to be able to incorporate data reporting into their solutions work. And the news organizations, they're also focused on developing new types of digital products. Um, video was a major focus in the last report. That remains a priority, but they've also moved into podcasts, newsletters, and different types of apps that can also help with those paid content strategies. Um, the Kit Messenger, and I have a picture of their podcast offer offerings here, it partners with the University of Kent TV station to produce videos, and they've also developed multiple podcasts, and they're working on developing their offerings for voice-activated home speakers and trying to grow the reach of their radio stations. West France also offers two to three podcasts for free per day, and they're looking at some subscription-based podcasts as well. Um, Keska Sumalanian um, is working on podcasts. Calava has a sports oriented podcast that's paywalled for subscribers. Um, and so these are different types of products that were very much evident across the sample as they work to diversify their offerings. Next slide. 
So in the 2018 report, we also looked at the relationships with platforms and interviewees discussed the different functions that social media serve for their newspapers with many citing Facebook as a very key driver of traffic. It was between 15 to 40% of traffic across the outlets, um, although several very much expressed concern about how much influence the platform exerts on their readership. And in this research, as a result, several newsrooms had reduced their reliance on Facebook traffic Topic. And while in the last report, some talked about the relationships with platforms as a necessary evil, in this research, it was described more as a symbiotic relationship. And so overall, the influence of platforms could be organized into three key functions, uh, which I outline here. And so for example, in terms of driving subscriptions, this was something that several of the outlets mentioned. And at West France, uh, between 16 to 19% of readers are coming from social media, including Facebook, which editors there said is relatively low compared to other French newspapers. Um, but it's something that has allowed them to draw readers to their website. And when they come, there are a lot of efforts they are made to try to convince them that they should subscribe to that content through the different types of packages they offer. Um, Facebook also remains very important for extending reach and reaching different types of readers that the outlets might not otherwise. Uh, so at Kent Messenger, about 40% of readers are coming from social media and 80% of that is from Facebook. Um, but they talked about how they're trying to be smarter about looking at the value of that audience because the Facebook audience doesn't always necessarily translate into subscribers. Um, but it is an opportunity to speak to people, to get news out, to get the brand out, and to try to potentially make some of those conversions. And finally, creating connections remains really important. So for example, at West Fallon Post, uh, Facebook is an important source of story ideas and opportunities to connect with people and potential readers. They get about 30% of their readers from Facebook. And Ann Kroom talked about how it can be a valuable reporting tool. So if you look before, journalists went to the bar in the evening um, to talk to people in the community and get story ideas. And now you can go to Facebook groups and that allows access to people with different types of interests and different types of areas to see what happens. And that was a key theme in the previous report as well. And so they're still finding ways to leverage those relationships as, as well as look to that shift to private um, groups and private apps that's shaping the platform environment. Uh, next slide. So ultimately, interviewees were very focused on helping people see why local news is important and worth paying for. And as a result, we could say that paid models have very much shown how to help outlets reconnect, reconnect and reinforce that mission of local news. And here's a quote here from Aurora Maval from Nice Matan, um, who talks about, it's, you know, it's hard to understand what readers are waiting for. We want to know what does the reader want? But she said that can't be the only question because that's very reductive. So what we need to think about is how can we be useful? How can we be a part of their daily life? How can we connect with them? And how can we build that bridge between journalists and readers, which is a theme that was very much evident across the sample. And there were several other examples that they mentioned that very much reinforce the important mission of local news and how they're trying to get that out. Um, so for example, there was discussions of a shift of the rush of daily news to slower and more lean back content, as one of the editors described. And this includes, you know, explaining complex topics and events to readers, which of course in the digital news report, as I mentioned previously, some readers are concerned about the ability of news to explain things. And so that's something that local media are talking about. Um, there were efforts in the UK to return local papers to their high streets. And I'll talk about an example of that in a minute. Um, there are discussions about addressing misperceptions about how local news is funded and produced and trying to be much more transparent with readers about about those processes, uh, developing consistent standards for quality and offering adequate resources across company holdings. So that's something that's consistently distributed, um, as well as there was some discussion of holding events to more organically connect with readers. And of course, it's really important to think about the fact that many of these functions that were mentioned in the interviews have been complicated by the coronavirus pandemic and local news organizations are facing dwindling advertising. They've had to adjust their approaches to culture and sports coverage, for example. Um, the event business is struggling, and this is despite those, uh, uh, those spikes in traffic that have come as people are trying to find information about their communities. Uh, next slide. 
So I'll conclude with a quick case study that I think um, shed some hope on the local news environment and some of the shifts that are happening. And this is about the Bishop Stortford Independent, which is a newspaper owned by Iliff Media in the UK. And uh, the two editors at the Bishop Stortford Independent, Paul Winspear and Sinead Kaur, they had worked on the high street on a title called the Hertz and Essex Observer, which was founded in 1861. It was owned by the Iliff family, which merged with the local world, which was purchased by reach and eventually the three newspapers in that group reduced the number of their editors to one and um, and the newspaper moved to some syndicated content uh, but in 2017 Edward Iliff approved the move of a launch of a new Stortford paper from the Hertz and Essex Observer offices and that allowed um, Paul and Sinead to be able to come back and work on this new outlet and um, in a uh, as this was happening, uh, Paul Winspear put a post on the Bishop Stortford Civic Federation Facebook page to say, hey, in a month, we're launching a new paper from this office. And he said there was a massive outpouring of support. And the Independence now, a weekly print newspaper focused on covering hyperlocal news, um, is templated by the Cambridge Independent, which is an award-winning local newspaper in the area. And it now covers a smaller area than that previous Hertz and Essex Observer publication. But as Paul put it, they're focused on content relevant to the daily lives of the population, informing them, entertaining them, educating them, reporting on news as it happens, and giving them um, information about issues we think will affect their lives. They're also very much focused on the print product. So as we can see from this quote, um, that there was a rush, of course, to digital first, which can harm the printed paper. And for them, the print publication is what their readers want. Uh, they enjoyed sitting in their office and seeing people come in and um, pay ADP to take their print newspaper with with them. They're also using their websites and Facebook um, to build their audience. Um, but what they found is that uh, they've been going two years and two months. And as Paul said, people still come into our shop and just say, oh, I'd like to buy a paper. And by the way, I think your paper's brilliant. And it's the feedback and support from the community that makes it all worthwhile, which is a quote from him. So I think this is an interesting example of um, some of the shifts that are happening in this market and the potential for local news outlets to come back and cover their communities. So thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Joy. Uh, <clears throat> I just stopped sharing my screen so we can see each other and people can see you properly. Um, it was a great presentation, uh, so thank you so much. And we have a few questions. I'm going to ask the first one, actually, if, uh, if, uh, if you let me do it. Um, I'm curious. I mean, from your conversations uh, with all those news organizations, and obviously those are conversations uh, from December to March, as you said, uh, what would you say are the main challenges and the main opportunities uh, for those uh, news outlets right now, uh, in this particular time with the pandemic, with all the problems for print, uh, with all the problems for distribution and, and, uh, and all that? Uh, what do you think they are? I think the, the challenges and opportunities are, are very, very similar according to those broad themes. And I did conduct uh, two of the interviews as the pandemic was uh, coming to light, and those were in Finland. Um, and particularly at Calava, one of the editors there said that, you know, of course they were working from home and they were having to make adjustments to their processes. But he said, you know, it's given us a chance to rethink our coverage, to rethink how to tell stories. So for example, we can't go out and cover sports and events, but we can offer historical context about some of those things. We can do some profiles. We can look at the things happening in our community in a different way, um, while also covering that breaking news that's drawing that traffic. Um, but of course, because advertising has been affected, um, print subscriptions, um, shop sales, all those things are affected. Um, that focus on drawing subscriptions and drawing paid readership is really important. So it's created a lot of conversations about um, what do we need to offer for free as a public service? How can we convert some of this traffic that's coming um, to paid and what are those stories that are going to do that. So it requires a continual focus and monitoring um, of those metrics, metrics and of that traffic to see what's going on. And so from what I can tell, at least from, from those Finnish respondents, that's something that's very much happening. Um, and I think, again, it just reinforces these conversations about what role local news serves, how to best serve that mission, um, and how to do that in these really just extreme circumstances uh, that are so difficult. And of course, it comes down to things like uh, transparency, reinforcing that mission, and just letting readers know these are the resources that are necessary to continue to produce credible information for you. And so, um, so I think, of course, it's, it's very difficult, but a lot of those challenges and opportunities remain. Mm. 
That's great. Uh, let's go to some of the questions of, <coughs> of our listeners. Um, Richard Copland uh, is asking, did Joy experience any organizations exploring paper read or single article sales as a new reader revenue stream? Uh, I think you touched a little, a little bit on this uh, with the Kent example, but if you can you know, uh, elaborate a little bit more, because it's, it's something that comes back. I mean, this question about micropayments, uh, mm -hmm. It hasn't been very successful so far, I guess, but, but I'm curious about the example and, and other examples that you can come across. Yeah, yeah, the Kit Messenger is definitely an interesting example of that. And they were still very much in the testing and experimental phases on their micropayment strategy when I talked with them. Um, there were several titles within that media group, so they were trying different types of approaches depending on the different titles because, of course, a one-size-fits-all isn't necessarily <laughs> always going to work. Um, and so they talked about that, um, you know, people paying for certain articles, but for just 60p, you can access everything. Um, and this goes on a month-to-month -month basis. They said... One of the big challenges, though, is that some people will, you know, put some money in that digital wallet and then not use it. <laughs> and so oh, yeah, there's yeah. a focus on, you know, once people have paid and once people have asked for that access, ensuring they take advantage of it and, and read that content. Um, they also talked about how they're working on a direct debit option that ensures ad free access um, as well as a paid app. And so they're trying to think about other types of tools and approaches that will just make this process as easy and headache free as possible. Um, uh, to encourage people to uh, work with that and to use that. Um, so again, it was very new, but there was definitely some some optimism there about the potential this might hold um, and and seeing what types of content is particularly valuable and also thinking about it in a very localized contextual way. That yeah, makes sense. Um, a question from Daniela Pinheiro is uh, our journalist fellow from, from Brazil. Uh, Daniela is asking, do you know uh, how these news outlets uh, measure their social impact? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I, I'm not sure um, which particular types of tools they're using. Um, I imagine, you know, CrowdTangle and, and some of these others um, are popular. Um, but they're definitely thinking about it, not just in the sense of, you know, how many likes or shares and those types of things, but really trying to be smarter and more strategic mm -hmm. about the role that their platforms serve. And so, as I mentioned previously, you know, um, extending their reach, that's really valuable. But now they're trying to think about, you know, how do our social media audiences actually convert into those loyal and engaged audiences that really want to invest in our work? And so, um, so really trying to scale back on the traffic that's coming from these platforms and figuring out how to use it in a smarter way. Um, several also talked about, particularly in the UK, the importance of those social media platforms for, again, reinforcing how local news is made. And so, for example, when Kent Messenger implemented the micropayment strategy, um, several of their staff, including their audience development manager, spent a lot of time on Facebook and other platforms engaging with readers about, you know, I know that this is different for you. I know some of you, you know, may be upset about this shift, but this is why we're doing it. And this is why it's important. And this is why um, putting resources into local news is really valuable. And so um, they've talked about, you know, the value of using those platforms to get those messages across. Hmm. A question for, from Harshini Agarwal. Uh, I think the question is about the process. I mean, how uh, you know, does uh, the news make it from digital to paper? How these uh, uh, news organizations are, are producing news for different channels, uh, I guess? Hmm. Um, it was very much evident that the shift um, um, across the outlets uh, is very much focused on a, a digital first uh, type of mentality. And again, as I mentioned, while their print products are still really valuable, they want to ensure that they're <clears throat> forward thinking, looking toward the future and figuring out how can we think digital first with the recognition that this is where things are headed. And so, as I mentioned with those, those German outlets, they've completely reconfigured and spent years thinking about their newsroom processes to ensure that they're thinking about broader themes and broader approaches to identifying valuable news, um, which is really, really important. So I think that theme-based approach I mentioned at MindPost is a really interesting way of thinking about that, that they have a centralized team called the Eye of Editors that looks at broad themes, how different stories from the you know, local bureaus all the way up um, can be invested in those themes and reflect those themes. Um, and then they've also reduced their um, print media
meetings to one per day, which for some outlets is a, is a really big shift when they might have had multiple per day focused on the print products. So they've tried to scale back on that, centralize some of their digital production, while also looking at finding ways to channel very local news up to regional audiences. So it's a complete, you know, rethinking of the processes and what should be prioritized. Um, that was something that was evident at West Fellow Post as well. Um, and so and so that's something that that was very, very common. So we recognize our print is important. Um, and there's also the interesting theme that looking at the print product is something that is it's, it's a product unto itself. It has a different aesthetic. Um, it has a different approach to the stories that work well there. Um, and so thinking about how can we make our print product more beautiful, something that people might keep for a while, um, and really orient our website toward other types of news and getting those out more immediately. Uh, we have now a question from a good friend of us, Nick Newman, uh, the lead <laughs> author of the Digital News Report. So from other work that you've done in this area, where are the opportunities for donations or memberships rather than subscriptions? Um, and he's saying that he's uh, seen more local newspapers just asking for money right now. Uh, is this just a US thing or, or is it something that you're also seeing in Europe, at least in some of the countries that you're studying? Um, definitely the UK outlets, uh, the question of asking um, for money and also talking about the role that their contributions serve uh, was something that was evident. And, and both the, the Yorkshire Post and Kent Messenger talked about this, of having those, those pop-ups or other types of messages that very much explain to readers um, why investing in local news is important and what value that can serve. Um, but this is something that I also saw in the French context. So for example, um, West France um, had had multiple different avenues uh, to engaging with paid content. And one of them is a program called Laplace, um, which is a membership program where readers who uh, participate in that have multiple different opportunities to get more value added experiences. So things like going to events, um, going to special places um, in the area, meeting with sources and meeting with um, officials. Um, from that area, as well as meeting with journalists and being able to talk and meet with them. And so they're trying to, you know, offer some opportunities that, you know, if you go to the next level and become part of this membership program, mm -hmm. you know, we treat you like family, we treat you like a community, and we give you access to things that you might not otherwise. Um, Nice Matan thinks about solutions journalism in a similar way, um, that those who subscribe to it are part of a special community um, where they can vote um, every other month on what topic uh, the Nice Matan is going to cover next. They can participate in crowdsourced investigations. They can come to events like debates where they talk about local issues. They can meet with journalists and they can very much participate in that engaged form of journalism that's becoming more and more a part of conversation. Um, so there are some efforts there to do that. Um, but across the sample, there were lots of discussions of events, opportunities. And of course, this is something that's you know going to look different um, in the current environment, but opportunities to bring people together to discuss issues, to engage with journalists, to understand better how journalism is produced. And I think that's something just across the board um, that's become very important. Mm. Uh, a question from Kamesh uh, Sekar um, asking, have there been any instances where news organizations, uh, these local news organizations, uh, have lifted uh, some articles from the paywall for public good? Of course, we are thinking right now about COVID-19, but uh, I guess there are more examples. Have you come across to any of those? Um, yes, definitely. I think particularly in the, the COVID-19 context, there's been lots of conversations about uh, removing the paywall for that news about the pandemic, particularly breaking news and how it's affecting communities. Um, and for example, one of the Finnish journalists I talked with post, you know, the rise of the pandemic said they're offering that information for free. That's very, very important. Um, but then when they look at historical or contextual driven reports about the rise of the pandemic, they're paywalling some of that. Um, so there's some conversations happening about, you know, that public interest journalism that people really need and how it's a social responsibility not to paywall that. But there are some ways of covering it that can um, be paywalled and offer some extra context and insights. And so I think um, just anecdotally, just, you know, what from I've been reading and from a few of those conversations, um, that is something that's happening. Um, um, which of course is, you know, partially attributable with that uh, increases in traffic and those spikes in traffic to pandemic-related coverage. 
We have another question from our friend Nick, actually. Um, <laughs> he's asking, have the local papers that you talked to hired new people with more experience of paid models in the last couple of years? That's a very interesting question because, you know, of course, yeah. the revenue models require some expertise and uh, I don't know, were these news organizations prepared for this kind of uh, revenue stream? Yeah, definitely. Um, I saw several references to, to hiring new people and new positions being created as a result of these shifts. Um, at West France, they talked about how they've hired several people, not only in editorial, but across IT and research and development and some other areas who can come in and help them think about new product development, help them think about taking topics like sports, for example, and putting those into different types of formats, podcasts and um, digital publications and those types of things. And so they've definitely um, increased and brought in some new staff members to focus on that. Um, it's something I've also seen in the UK context. So Kent Messenger is an audience development manager who's looking at these things and is supervising that micropayment strategy. Um, and, uh, and other outlets too mentioned that it's been important to not only bring in new talent um, who has expertise in things like paid models as well as in podcasting and video and some of those other types of approaches, um, but as well as training those that they have to really think about that in different ways. Um, in the previous report, there were some examples where newsrooms said, well, some of our longtime reporters, you know, um, it's harder to, to teach some of these new skills. So we're going to, you know, specifically train some of these other people who have that expertise. But now the conversation is really, we need everybody on board with this. We need everyone to understand what we're doing, why it's important, how to think about content value differently. Um, there's a lot of conversations about being able to, as the Mind Post example, um, categorize content, understand what should be premium and behind the paywall. And and really empowering staff members at all levels to be able to make those decisions so it doesn't just come down to one person. Um, so I think it's something that's very much shaped um, and influencing the culture of some of these newsrooms um, in addition to bringing in those new people. Mm. Um, just one question on, on one more question about COVID-19. I mean, do you think that it's going to accelerate uh, uh, the end of print for some of you know, these local publications. You, you mentioned before that most of the ones that you're studying uh, get, you know, at least most of their income from print still. Uh, what do you think is going to happen in the next, let's say, six months, in the next year or so? Um, of course, it's it's really it's difficult to make predictions um, because you know these outlets are all very different and different types of media systems. But some of the articles I've read said that that yeah, this is going to very much accelerate some of those challenges um, because of course um, deliveries um, are stopping um, for some outlets in the UK, um, for example. Um, in some cases, they were having volunteers do their deliveries, um, and in those markets where newspapers um, are reliant on newsstand sales or shop sales, that's something that's it's very much declined. Um, and not to mention, of course, the advertising revenue in the print product. And so I think it potentially could speed up um, some of this focus on really investing um, in digital opportunities and, and digital paid models and figuring out what's going to work. Um, there was also an interesting anecdote from a, a journalist in Finland who said they had to combat uh, misinformation about some of this, that some people were worried that a print delivery could be contaminated. And so they had to, you know, respond to readers and let them know, you know, it's okay okay, we're taking the proper precautions to get you your print newspaper. Um, so of course, it, you know, it'll look different in different contexts, but, um, um, but I think, you know, it may potentially, you know, speed up this increased investment in those digital products. Um, and then there's also been some, um, you know, tax relief and things like that for e-editions uh, that can help with that as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, a couple of questions on podcasts. Um, um, the first one from Asrita Sethi. Uh, she's asking, um, what is the procedure that uh, uh, they follow, this news organization follow, uh, in terms of producing the podcast and how do they earn themselves a living? I mean, how they make money out of this, because sometimes it's not so clear. Uh, and the second question is kind of related. Will the uses of podcasts uh, continue to be the same uh, even after these lockdowns? And that's a question about usage, and we are seeing that uh, you know, it, you know, the kind of uh, daily routines of uh, everybody are changing during lockdown that may have an impact in the medium term. 
Yeah, the podcast question is really interesting. And I saw several different strategies and approaches for producing those. Um, so in some cases, um, outlets had partnerships with local radio stations or they own local radio stations. And so that created a very natural tie uh, to be able to create that audio focused content. And so um, I saw examples of that in the UK as well as in Finland um, and at, at West France as well. And so they were very easily able to create those partnerships to create um, really high quality audio content. Um, in some cases, it was just deploying journalists with particular expertise and, and beat focuses to create those podcasts. Uh, so for example, at Calava, they have a sports podcast. And so they took members of their sports team um, and they started to create that um, and were able to engage in some training and things to be able to produce that effectively. Um, and so there were several different you know, strategies, but I think the key one is just really leveraging collaborative partnerships uh, within communities. Some out outlets had partnerships with the local TV station, the radio station, as I mentioned, and being able to use those different platforms to create high quality content. And again, I'll mention, um, so earlier in the presentation, I said the goal is to, um, you know, publish less, but publish very high quality. And I think the same goes for podcasts. So not having just a ton of them for the sake of having those, but really investing in some high quality offerings. Um, and it was a mix, too, of those that were offered for free. Um, but from what I can tell, there was very much an interest in figuring out how to um, make those more subscriber based. Um, and also some conversation too about um, home speakers and creating more very local audio content um, that people could consume via that platform as well. Mm -hmm. Well, a final question. I mean, uh, of course, there are different types of local news organizations. And I'm curious, I mean, do you think it is going to be easier uh, to survive for uh, purely independent uh, local news organizations uh, or for those that are, you know, owned by big chains, by big companies, uh, as, as some of the ones that you described before? Um, you know, it's hard to say um, which strategy is going to uh, to be more effective in that way. Um, I will say that, like in the UK context, there's been some concern among independent hyperlocal outlets that they can't always benefit in the same way. So, um, for example, you know, um, advertising campaigns for the NHS, which injects, you know, money into some outlets, but the very local hyperlocal online um, independent outlets aren't always privy to those same benefits. And so that's definitely a conversation um, that is emerge. But um, in terms of whether, you know, chain or, or very local, um, it's hard to say. I um, mean, our last book, uh report, we very much di differentiated um, those three different strategies. And we didn't say one was more effective than the other, um, but was most important is just this continued focus on, on innovating, rethinking practices, being willing to look beyond um, those traditional ways of doing things and recognizing that that revenue model that was used for years just doesn't work anymore um, and will continue to be challenged um, in the environment that we have now. And so I think that, um, and that was evident in that last theme I mentioned, this very much focusing on the mission of local news. And I think the outlets that are, you know, really focusing on that um, and trying to create that distinctive content, they're the ones that seem most optimistic about sustainability. Mm. It's nice to, to close with, uh, at least with, with some optimism. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Joy. Uh, finally, I would like to say, as, as always, I always do three things. First, thank you everyone for coming. We know how busy you are and how difficult these times are for journalists everywhere in the world. So, so we really appreciate your time and we hope that you uh, have enjoyed the, the seminar. Um, second, um, we will send uh, Joy's slides and also the video uh, through email to everyone that has signed up. So, and, and it will also be available on our website. So, so just check it out. We hope that you enjoy and, and share it uh, as much as you can. And finally, I always say the same, but please wash your hands and you know, follow the advice of your government uh, uh, during this pandemic because it's really, really rough out there. And we hope that you really stay safe and stay sane. And we will be back next week. Uh, you will receive information about the seminars that we have next week. Uh, the one on, uh, on Wednesday, by the way, uh, is with Sarah Sands, uh, the former editor uh, from the Today program at the BBC. Really, really interesting, especially right now. Uh, so we will be back on uh, Wednesday. Uh, you know, in the meantime, we hope that you stay safe, stay sane, and we see you uh, next week. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thank you.